Good morning, everybody, to today's event organized by Globe, uh, Global Bergen. Um, we're going to uh, have a very interesting discussion about the Olympic Games uh, and its domestic and international dimensions. Uh, I am very impressed to see so many people here in the audience and also in the uh, I see that in the, uh, the offline audience uh, is also increasing. Um, this is uh, not uh, taken for granted at that hour of the day, I guess. Um, okay, so um, we will, we're going to have 45 minutes discussion and after that 15 minutes uh, time for um, questions that uh, the audience in the online and uh, the online and the offline audience can ask. So the, uh, just to, to explain uh, the audience in the, uh, in the offline who are here at the venue, um, I would ask you then to come, uh, to come forward and uh, raise your questions in front of the microphone. And for those in the, uh, in the, uh, the online audience, okay, um, uh, can you use the chat or the Q&A uh, function? Okay. So on February 4th at 8 p.m. in Beijing, uh, the Winter Olympic Games 2022 were solemnly inaugurated at the Bird's Nest Olympic Stadium. This year's, uh, this year's games carry historical importance. Uh, Beijing is the world's first dual Olympic city. This means that for the first time in history, a city has hosted both the summer and the winter Olympic games. Um, this selection, uh, host selection, demonstrates China's economic and political leverage within the International uh, Olympic Committee and beyond. And moreover, the winter Olympic games mark a changing world order in where China is or wants to be more than just a rising economic power. Developments in China and its international relations markedly distinguish this year's Winter Olympic Games from the Summer Olympic Games in 2008. Then many expected that China's entry into the WTO and the hosting of the Olympic Games would support political reforms. These hopes were dashed, especially at the latest party Congress in 2017, where Xi Jinping concentrated all power in his person. Since then, China has become more authoritarian rather than democratic. The run-up and the staging of the Winter Olympic Games 2022 have been accompanied by controversial discussions. For example, developments in Hong Kong, China's assertive uh, attitude in international relations and towards Taiwan, the increasingly tightening space for civil society and the worsening human rights situation in China. Arguably, the games will go down as one among the most contested in history. Today, we have invited three China pundits to tackle some of the controversies and make sense of them. Chef de Strömen is foreign correspondent of, the, of NRQ in China. She has been in an Asia correspondent for several years and has reported from China since 2017, if I'm informed correctly. Uh, today, she joins us live uh, from Bergen. Uh, uh, sorry, Beijing. <laughs> to be two cities that start with me. <laughs> okay, from Beijing. Um, Heidi Östby uh, Hogan is prof uh, professor of China studies at the Department of Cultural Studies and Oriental Languages at the University of Oslo. She wrote her master thesis on the Olympic Games 2008, but has since focused on China Africa relations. Finally, Öystein Tünsche is head of the Asia program at the Institute for Defense Studies at the Norwegian Defense University College. He specializes in international relations, uh, security politics, and military development. Welcome to all three of you. My name is Julia Marinaccio, and I'm a postdoc fellow at the, department, uh, at the Department of Foreign Languages at the University of Bergen. And my, my research focuses on environmental governance in China and China-Taiwan relations. I would like to start the discussion with a question to all three guests. Um, international and domestic developments have changed significantly since 2008. How have these changes informed the Games 2022? 
and in what respects to, do they differ from those in 2008? I don't know who wants to start. Sure, I can go. Uh, so as Sushesh and I were discussing before we came on, and very nice to be here and thank you for, for organizing. Um, it, the mood in Beijing was very different when Beijing got its 2008 game, which um, were given to Beijing in 2001. There was genuine uncertainty whether they would get the games, whether the world would find China um, to be a worthy organizer of the games, and whether um, the games would be a success at all. And we see now that this year, there's no question about whether China has the organizing capacity to, to pull off something like the games. There's um, no question whether the world finds China important. And instead of asking the world to uh, give the games to China and to come and enjoy the games together with China, China is demanding that they deserve to host the Olympics, they deserve respect, and uh, they're not asking the world to offer it up. So when there have been, for example, the diplomatic boycotts and, and other noise around the Olympics, uh, they're not going into dialogue with the, those concerns, but saying, you know, suit yourself, don't come. And then for the diplomatic boycott, for example, they then uh, responded by uh, uh, inviting Putin. So it's still a very high level games, but with a very, very different atmosphere from last time. Thank you. Maybe yeah, I would, I would say, can I go now? Yes, please. Uh, so I was here uh, when China was awarded the games uh, the first time. I was a correspondent also in China from 1999 to uh, 2003. And uh, at that time, it was an amazing coming out party. People were so happy. It was like total chaos in the streets. Uh, there were police, of course, in the streets as well, but they, there was nothing they could do about those people who were like driving their cars, hanging out, you know, the, the windows of the cars. Uh, it was like a, an amazing party. And I remember at that time uh, that uh, we had a discussion in one of our news programs on radio where the guests there uh, who were in Oslo all thought that all the Chinese who were happy about the games actually were told to go out and celebrate, which was not my experience. I experienced that some, like in uh, like a huge party that people really, really, um, they were so happy that they were awarded the games. This time, I was not here when they were awarded the Games, but now I'm here during the Games before uh, also. And um, I would say that the atmosphere is totally different. Of course, it's because of COVID as well, that uh, everyone's kind of now in Beijing have been lining up for COVID tests because we've had some COVID in Beijing as well. But uh, it's, not like a, it's not like a big celebration about the Games this time. It's more, you know, um, you can see also the way they actually put together the opening ceremony. It's supposed to be low key. It's supposed to be simple. And that's the kind of spirit we see also in the society, I think. And this time it's more, I think, the government's wish to use the uh, Olympics as an arena for their um, middle class to join more in sports. They've spent a lot of money especially on Nordic skiing, on trainers from Norway to educate their um, stars in uh, this sport. And they're hoping, I think, probably to host another uh, Olympics where they can show what they have been actually succeeding in. They've been doing a lot of strange things, I would say, this time. They're, um, although it doesn't seem like medals are that important, that's at least what Xi Jinping said, uh, we still see that they bought basically the whole ice hockey team. They have people who are not Chinese, but they paid them to come and uh, join the Chinese team. We have uh, Gu Ailin, who is uh, brought up in the US with Chinese mother and American father. She's now their big hero. We don't even know if she has changed her citizenship to from the US to China because China doesn't really allow, allow dual so this seems like China might have given her the possibility to have her um, uh, both 
the Chinese and uh, US citizenship to actually be a hero of these games. And we see also other, um, there's a skater also who's brought up in the US and is supposed to um, be a hero of these games, but um, uh, actually failed and was not, um, what should I say, praised this much because people are kind of skeptical to the fact that China is putting together this show, which is not really you know, Chinese. So to me, it's like a very different Olympics, not just because of the COVID, but also because of the people's spirit. And uh, it doesn't seem to me that they're kind of taking it so much to their heart this time as they did before, even though quite a few people seem to be proud of it. Thank you. Uh, Einstein? Thank you, uh, Julia. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this um, uh, to this webinar. Um, yes, I of course agree with the, the other participants that this is very different. Uh, and I would like to highlight four four aspects. Um, the first is the role of Xi Jinping. Um, in two thousand and eight, he he sort of was in line to become the next president. Uh, he he this kind of power transition internally in China was very much um, uh, consolidated. Um, today, uh, of course, Xi Jinping is in a very strong position, but at the same time, there is uh, uncertainty about uh, the future of, uh, of the Chinese leadership. And, uh, and I think this is also reflected in, in the, the kind of control and, and, uh, uh, and the organization of this Olympic. Um, so, so yes, it, it, it shows the strength and, and sort of the, the confidence, which Heidi pointed to. Um, but at the same time, there is something uncertainty about the core sort of political uh, situation in China, uh, which, which I think this uh, Olympic uh, is sort of an interesting uh, way of looking at it. Um, the second is, of course, uh, the, the Chinese economy. Uh, back in 2008, uh, China came out of its you know, biggest growth year in 2007. Officially, it was 14% growth. Uh, as we speak now, the Chinese economy is, is struggling much more. Um, well, of course, uh, the growth have been fantastic uh, since 2008. So the Chinese economy is now much, much larger, which means that even four or five percent growth uh, is, is, is a lot of growth. There is still a lot of uncertainty related to the Chinese economy. And I think this is also um, part of uh, you know, the way uh, one would uh, interpret this Olympic, uh, going back to what Shashti talks about, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of grand schemes and everything, um, which, is, uh, which is different than back in 2008. Um, but of course, this is reflected of the COVID situation, um, so, so it's hard to, uh, hard to compare. Um, but the third point is, of course, that we're now living in a completely different world because of the rise of China. We're living in a new bipolar international system with two superpowers, the United States and China. And this is, of course, it has directly impact on the Olympics with the diplomatic boycotts. But it, it also provides a totally different context for this Olympic compared to the Olympic in 2008 where the United States were accommodating China, where the United States were engaging China, while now uh, the United States is seeking to balance China, maybe seeking to contain China. So this new superpower rivalry is a totally different uh, context for, for viewing this uh, Olympic. Thank you so much for all your responses. Um, due to, uh, since Cherste ha has a very tight schedule, um, I, uh, I had to reschedule, uh, reorder a little bit the questions and I would like to start, uh, to start with her. Um, so during, uh, uh, during all events of high political importance in China, media contents are highly surveyed and, and negative news are suppressed. But for the 2008 games, uh, the restrictions, especially for foreign journalists were temporarily relaxed. 
Um, at this time, the Chinese government uh, did not make any concessions, uh, did not make such concessions. Uh, in November, the Foreign Correspondence Club of China issued an official statement that addressed both the IOC and the Chinese authorities, expressing its deep concerns about uh, this restricted uh, reporting environment, especially regarding the Olympics. So Shasti, could you please share a little bit your experience and tell us a bit more about the reporting conditions in China in the past month and now during the games? Yeah, let, let me go a bit, a bit back from that because um, I was here before the games that were, were awarded, I mean, in 2008. And at that time, I think the situation working in China for journalists is a bit like it is now. So I have not really uh, been part of that um, era where it was easier to work as a journalist in China. So to me, it's the same thing now that it was before. Uh, what happened, it seemed to me, was that it was kind of a part of the package that uh, China, uh, when it was awarded the games, that they would make it easier for uh, foreign correspondents to work in China. It was um, kind of an end to the time when we had to apply to go to different regions, which made it almost impossible to plan anything and you would be followed everywhere when you went there. Now, after that, we can freely um, go almost wherever we want, even to Xinjiang, but not to Tibet. And um, uh, what was the complaint from the uh, Foreign Correspondent Club now before the Olympic is that it it seemed like the government was using COVID as an excuse for a lot of things for not to give us access. So there was a, a complaint given to the IOC about that. And what, as from my perspective, it seems like that helped a bit. But generally, uh, the situation has deteriorated a lot, not just for us, I would say. It's also uh, quite evident that uh, it's difficult for people to speak their opinion. I just spoke to uh, some people a few days ago and I was um, kind of a bit surprised how open they would be to me about how they're struggling with the situation now that they feel that you know they cannot carry their phone because someone might be listening. They feel that they cannot voice their opinion because that might be used against them. So they uh, almost like continuously kind of feel like they people feel like they kind of want to empty out their frustration to me. And then they, the next thing they say is that you cannot broadcast this. You cannot tell the world that I, I said this, not even in your country. So uh, there's like a, a situation where we actually feel, I feel more kind of, um, what should I say, that I have to, even when people are outspoken, that I have to be careful not to voice their opinion because you know, it's it's a sensitive time. It's not really allowed to be critical to the government. And people are feeling that strongly. And that's different from before because we didn't have the same technology, I think, when I was here in China the first time. Um, and when it comes more to the Olympics, I think a lot of my colleagues who are covering the Olympics more closely than uh, NRK is, um, because they have more correspondence, they have more, um, what should I say, um, airtime, that they are facing more trouble than we are. I find that NRK is usually not that much followed. We are not really uh, stalked a lot. We usually kind of find our way around it, but it's, it's kind of track and field, you know, it's like you have to kind of, um, when you meet these hurdles, you have to jump over them. So it's, it's kind of a way of living, I would say, in China now that your work is difficult. It's, it's problematic, it's challenging, and sometimes it's about people who don't want to talk, other times it's about protecting those people who actually talk, which is quite frustrating because it's difficult then to actually show people that the Chinese also have their own opinion. They also, they're not just uh, voicing the opinions of the party, but they also have their opinion because I cannot really uh, broadcast it. Thank you. I would like to follow up on, on what you just said. You said that uh, you have uh, like you have a, a fairly or, or maybe a slightly better in, in, in working environment than maybe journalists that come from the United States uh, or uh, I don't know, maybe Germany, bigger countries. Do you think the 
like uh, what what what's the factor here? Is it that Norway is a small country and uh, and uh, and uh, and has good relationships now with China, uh, or are there other factors involved? Maybe the size of uh, of the of the foreign correspondence team uh, uh, correspondent team in 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 China. Yeah, I think there are several factors and it's difficult to know which one is actually uh, dominant, but I think that all the Nordic broadcasters and, and media have a more like, uh, what should I say, objective position in reporting about China. Um, and that's maybe because we're small, but also maybe we're just not in that political situation that, for example, the US is or, the, or Great Britain is. Like we've seen, the BBC, you know, uh, basically having to flee the country uh, to Taiwan after being worried that he would actually be taken to court. And that's not like something you want to do in China um, because you don't know what they're going to use against you. So he fled with his family. And then we have Australian journalists who fled and we have American journalists who've been kicked out. So we're not that many either at the moment. So. So that's another thing. I think the um, US-China situation where both countries have kicked out journalists. So, the, so this is not just China kicking out American journalists, but American um, US kicking out Chinese um, journalists. So this is like a part of the big picture of the struggle between China and the US at the moment, the great divide, so to speak, which we're not that closely a part of. And I also think that maybe they don't really particularly find Norwegian broadcasting as influential as uh, more international organizations. So that could also be part of the reason. Um, and uh, yeah, I, it's, it's hard to know exactly what it is. Okay, thank you. Maybe, maybe uh, also, uh, no, we didn't join the boycott. Uh, that that might be uh, maybe this would have attracted more more attention, uh, drawn more attention to Norway. Um, but I don't know. This is yeah. uh, this is guesswork. Um, yes, I would, say, are, I would say yeah. actually, I would say actually that you know at the, during the time when Norway was in the freezer because of the peace prize given to Leo Sarbo, uh, NRK's working conditions were not good. So that's. It's a different political environment as well than it is now. And uh, I think also the fact that Norway is kind of um, uh, not doing boycotts of China and, uh, and uh, having a positive approach to China also probably makes them uh, look more positive on broadcasters from, from Norway. I've seen colleagues from Sweden, even though also like I said, Nordic countries seem to not be as, as uh, pressured as others, that uh, Sweden for a while was also in trouble because of, uh, you know, critical opinions voiced in Sweden against China very strongly. And a, also a, uh, um, a uh, China ambassador who was very critical to whatever criticism came um, to towards China from Swedish sources. So that might also have played a role, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I would. Uh, I know that you have to leave at nine. So uh, I, I apologize to the other panel, uh, 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 panel participants. I have to stick a little bit with Shasti. Um, since we're already with the boycotts, the topic of the boycotts, uh, how did the Chinese public react to the boycotts? I don't know if anybody of you has seen the program yesterday where Shesti also reported from the spot, uh, but I couldn't, I, can't, I couldn't avoid to ask this question also today. Um, so maybe you could share a little bit of your impression, what, pe how people took the boycotts uh, in China. Yeah, so there's people I've spoken to is uh, on the streets of, of Beijing, and it seems like a lot of people don't really know about the boycott. They say that uh, it's not been broadcasted that much from the Chinese side, that that's actually happening. And we could also see from the opening ceremony that they didn't actually show any uh, politicians, not even Putin, who was there. So maybe that's like one way of, of kind of uh, hiding a bit the fact that who's there and who's not. 
Um, other people also, actually quite quite a lot of people spoken to when it comes to Xinjiang say that uh, they don't understand what this whole thing is about. It has to be a lie. If you go to Xinjiang as a tourist, everything's beautiful and the people are so nice, so forthcoming. There's no trouble in Xinjiang. And I've seen that with my own eyes also. There's like hordes of, of Chinese tourists going to Xinjiang. And of course, they don't go to um, the prisons or the uh, you know education centers or, or anything. Like even me as a journalist, I mean, it's difficult to actually um, find proof of what's going on there. So for their from their perspective, it's not happening and they don't believe that uh, China would do something like that. And um, I would just like to say something more about the um, uh, politicizing of the games because China then, you know, of course reacts with saying that politics and, and um, sports should not be mixed. However, we see that, you know, that's exactly what China is doing because uh, Putin is coming and uh, he's having political meetings with, with uh, Xi Jinping. There are other countries who have representatives in Beijing and they all have political um, meetings with Xi Jinping on the side of the Olympics. We saw in um, ahead of the opening ceremony that a soldier who fought on, uh, um, fought on the border against India who was injured there, that he carried the, the torch which uh, you know, really pissed um, India off. And they said they would not send anyone when, when this happens. We also saw that um, uh, during the ceremony, there was like this heart, this ice heart, and there's a little, little, you know, just one kind of being lost and being tripping around and then being led back to the flock. And we all think this must be about Taiwan. So yes, we all uh, would say that China is definitely also mixing politics and sports during this Olympics. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, I would like to raise the next question to Eustein, uh, since we are already in the international dimension and he's the expert on China, uh, on China's international relations here. What do you think uh, how the games will affect the already strained international relations and also like the uh, International Olympic Committee uh, that, uh, that drew a lot of accusations and criticism. Well, I think, uh, I think uh, for me, the, the really, really important uh, takeaway uh, for international relations is the meeting between Xi Jinping and, and, and Putin. Um, I, I, ha I have the whole uh, document, uh, the joint statement between Russia and, uh, and, and China. This is uh, almost 10 pages. They cover every aspect in international affairs, more or less. Um, and specifically, uh, China, for the first time, as I can, can tell, previously, China has been very general with their statements about a multipolar world, and non-interference in internal affairs and so forth. But in this statement, they are explicitly saying that they uh, support Russia's demands against the United States and NATO, that they are critical about NATO's enlargement, and that they, uh, that they support uh, Russia's uh, demands for security guarantees in Europe. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very, very new development that, that China is uh, picking sides clearly uh, in European security affairs. Um, I'm not saying that China will sort of have a alliance uh, with the Russia, but but this is this is a, a, a clear shift in their foreign policy and in Sino-Russian relations, which I think is highly important to recognize. Um, so 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 for me, this is the most important sort of development. Um, uh, that connect this kind of uh, political uh, and, and the Olympic, given that uh, this uh, joint statement was issued on the opening day of the Olympic and the meeting also were held on the opening day and, and, uh, and on the 3rd of February, the day before. Um, 
more broadly of course the olympic is 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 uh, is just adding to the growing uh, rivalry between the united states and china which also affects every matters of international politics um and it's becoming more and more difficult for for states to maneuver uh given this new superpower rivalry uh, they are feeling the pressure from uh, alignment either with the united states or with uh, with china of course many states prefer not to choose sides but this is becoming more and more difficult uh, and this also applies to the international olympic committee which is um, in the future will have a more constrained uh, uh, sort of environment to to work within uh, we know from the from the Cold War period, and I'm not arguing at all that we will see another Cold War, but this new superpower rivalry between the United States and China will have major impact on international relations and in, including uh, 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 other Olympic games in the future, uh, which, uh, which of course uh, we saw during the Cold War and which we are now gradually seeing again with this kind of uh, diplomatic boycotts by some countries of this particular Olympic. Uh, I would thank you for your answer. I would like to first stick a little bit with China Russia relations. So, if we look at China Russia and the US from the, a triangular perspective, um, do you think that with uh, this, uh, these developments, with the recent developments, that the power balance is, uh, is shifting? And who would be the pivot then? Will China be now the pivot in this triangular relationship? Well, the, the power balance have been shifting for, for decades. I mean, when I lecture or give talks and nobody knows this, which is very surprising, uh, but if I ask, do you know how much larger China's GDP is compared to Russia? Nobody knows the answer. And China has today an economy which is about 10 times larger than Russia. China is much, much, much more powerful than Russia. Um, but this kind of relationship between China and Russia is beneficial to both Russia and, the, and China because Russia would like to focus on, on the threat from NATO and the threat from the United States. China would like to focus on the threat from the United States in maritime East Asia. Uh, and it's very uh, beneficial for both China and Russia not to uh, compete uh, against each other, not to be rivals, but instead to have this strategic partnership. But that does not mean that China militarily, I think, will, will support Russia in their, in their endeavors in, in Europe. And Russia will never support China in a war against the United States over Taiwan or the South China Sea, but still they have this strategic uh, rationale of uh, not being enemies when they have a sort of, as an American say, a bigger fish to fry. Uh, both are more concerned about the United States. And, and I'm not saying that this will uh, uh, remain like this for the you know, uh, foreseeable future, um, uh, because of course, China is becoming more and more uh, powerful, and, and this is a concern for Russia, but all in all, uh, it is better for Russia to work with China to achieve its ambitions in Central uh, Central Europe and in Southern Europe and in, in the high north uh, than it is to challenge Russia, even if that means uh, 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 seeking kind of an engagement with the West, uh, which is uh, very, very difficult at the current stage. Uh, but even if that was possible 10, 20 years down the road, it still wouldn't change the balance of power. China would still be much more powerful than Russia. And, uh, and the real uh, rivalry today is, is largely between the United States and, and China. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I would like to uh, ask Heidi a question. Yesterday, or, uh, I think it was yesterday, I saw um, a post on, Weib on Weibo, which is the Chinese um, like uh, Facebook, um, and the uh, there was there was a post uh, putting two photos side by side. One was the um, when she uh, um, like the 
leaders of the uh, uh, the Chinese leadership in, uh, with Xi Jinping at, at the front entering the uh, the, the the hall, uh, followed by followed by a lot of uh, state leaders from African countries. And this, uh, most of them were from African countries. There was Putin, but the, a lot of them were from African countries. Uh, and um, the pictures was, juxt uh, was juxtaposed with a picture from 2008 games when Hu Jintao entered the same place uh, with uh, President Bush and followed by a bunch of European and, and, and other Western uh, state heads. Um, so since you look into China-Africa relations, do you have any uh, insight into how the games could, uh, like, are perceived in, in, in those states that you look at, uh, both by government and the societies? Well, for most nations in the world, the Winter Games is not really the Olympic Games. So now there's the African Cup of Nations going on, which uh, Senegal just won. And uh, I think, if anything, it will be received with a great big shrug from uh, from African countries. But um, all nations, I'm, I'm tagging on to what Einstein said, all nations, uh, when they are, whatever is happening, you need a kind of national story to go along with that. And from 2001 to 2008, China was rising very fast. And um, the opening ceremony at that time was very important just to put a big um, full stop or to put a big um, an imagery that could uh, symbolize what was, what was happening to the world, but also internally. Uh, so the, uh, the Olympic Games can be important, as you say, as... Um, as a way of showing to the world what's happening or showing to the world how you are interpreting what's happening. So for African nations, and now we're going a bit out of what was the topic, but since you were the one to, to bring it up, what China does every year is to uh, go on a state visit first thing every year to African nations. And this goes back to the Mao era. And it also ties into uh, how they present their place in the world who, um, which countries they are allied with, um, what their development trajectory has been, that they too have been a poor country in the recent past that has risen and now they're a rich country, but also that they have been a great civilization in the distant past. And these um, uh, kinds of, these pieces of information are often brought into um, and, and a picture, like you say, or um, graphic presentation, but also things like the opening ceremony. So when Beijing in 2008 were hosting their opening ceremony, they uh, used Zhang Yimou uh, as the director of that ceremony, and they very much highlighted that distant great past that they had had. Um, and a lot of Chinese people were actually skeptical to that choice. They weren't really condoning it because they felt we have come so far, so why um, highlight those, those traditional things? Why not uh, put on the stage some of the uh, more modern things that we have achieved? And as we now all know that opening ceremony turned out to be a great success abroad, it's been rerun on American TV, on European TV, and it's one of the few Olympic openings that are important for their show value. Whereas uh, this time around, they had the same director, Zhang Yimo, who has these like beautiful films uh, about China's distance. <coughs> but the opening ceremony was much more bland. So um, it was, they put children on the stage, they had the doves, they had some like staple imagery of the 56 uh, nationalities represented, but it wasn't at all uh, the kind of coming out party that the 2008 Olympics were. So short answer is, a big shrug of the shoulders to this Olympic from most parts of the world. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to stick with this topic since you brought it up, uh, narratives. Um, so how China presents itself. And uh, and you said that um, they wanted to, uh, uh, they tried not to, um, 
to present maybe a more modern image and not uh, not too much on on, on tr uh, traditional symbols or and whatsoever. I remember that there was a huge discussion on Weibo on the official uniforms that were criticized by the Chinese uh, population of being too traditional and and not um, uh, like like presenting an, a very romanticized uh, and and bygone image of, of China. Uh, so I think there was also a lot of pressure from from like pressure in indirect pressure from uh, from the population uh, to uh, to present China not as a, a tra not in its traditional forms uh, solely. I don't know whether you agree with this uh, statement. Um, but another thing that you brought up is uh, like our uh, is the audience. I mean, uh, in 2008, uh, I was there too. And I remember that people were excited. Uh, um, one, uh, they, they also had the chance to, to, uh, to join, uh, like to participate in the games and, and the, uh, to be part of the audience at the opening ceremony, ceremony but also uh, then the competitions. And this is totally different now. So China, the way China portrays itself is very different from 2008, but also the audience. So to whom do they actually speak? Um, well, with, with all of these events, they, they speak to a foreign audience and they speak to, to domestic audiences. But again, I, I think we can overestimate what these uh, Olympics mean. I think I would see it more as a symptom than as anything that... Uh, is bringing about any change. And I think it's reflected in the slogan of these Olympics, which is simple, safe, and splendid. And if they were to go with any two of these words, it would probably be simple and safe. So uh, no one is really uh, impressed, but that was not the point either. Uh, they don't need to please the whole world to make these games a big success. They need to, to pull them off in a stately manner and they're doing that well i would disagree that, uh, with the statement simple because uh i read an uh an investigation that was published by the insider and according to this uh according to their calculations uh china declared that it would organize a very simple but still splendid olympic games uh with a budget of 3.9 billion dollars and uh in uh, in the end they spent 49 million uh, billion dollars on on the whole thing uh and most of it went to in, into infrastructure so also this uh, presentation of simple games uh, is kind of does not match realities uh, financial realities um, Oystein, do you have something to add to uh, to this um, narrative uh, pers uh, narratives perspective? Well, I um, well, of course. I mean, you can't disagree with <laughs> Heidi. Is uh, like if you look at the entire world, the Winter Olympic is not the biggest uh, event. But still, for us Norwegians, we should celebrate. You have just gotten on the gold medal, which is uh, fantastic. Um, um, but I, but I also take away some 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 different narratives. Uh, I mean, what strikes me is. Uh, is watching the the sprint uh, final uh, uh, the other day, um, where this Chinese athlete Wang Qiang got um, uh, disqualified, um, and you know, looking at him raising up that last hill inside the stadium, it's just you know the way he um, he accelerated and the way he just moved. A, over the Norwegian athletes, Paul Gulbar's skis, and just you know he fall fall down, and and he just uh, <laughs> boosts his his way through the field there, and uh, he got in second and was qualified for the final, and then he was disqualified. But I just couldn't help. Uh, like for me, it was this narrative about China rising, uh, about China just you know stepping up uh, and, 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 and sort of racing to the top. Um, now uh, you still have this kind of um, rules within the, within the Olympics, but I don't think we have those rules in international politics. So, so to me, I mean, this was an interesting way of, you know, uh, 
uh, pointing to a narrative of, of the rise of China. Um, when it comes to spending, I, I, I think you're, you're absolutely uh, right, Julia. I don't, I don't think this is simple. Uh, 49 billion is a lot. And, and uh, as with all Olympics, they spend much more money than, than what they budget to begin with. Uh, even uh, uh, in Lillehammer, we, we have the same problems on a much smaller uh, scale. So yeah, um, it's just some takeaways for me. Yeah, and I think uh, to end that, um, with the scale that the Olympics have taken on, we cannot expect anyone to arrange it in a way that's uh, environmental, environmentally sustainable, yeah, uh, sure. financially sustainable, or maybe even socially sustainable. And that's not just something for China to think about, that's something for the whole world to think about, whether this model of having games of that scale move around from city to city every four years is something that we want to continue supporting or whether we need to look into completely different organizational ways. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, and the issue of the sustainability of the Olympic Games would be, uh, could be sub, uh, a topic for another or a separate uh, uh, breakfast meeting. Um, and um, and, and also how, how the IOC will, uh, will like organize or not organize the games in the future uh, because it, will, it, it is not sustainable anymore. They, they, have, they have been having problems finding a host city for the, Olympic, uh, for the Winter Olympic Games this, uh, this year. So there were nine cities that, uh, that participated in the bid and seven drew out of it because they couldn't, uh, they couldn't manage, uh, they, there wasn't this, uh, the space for organizing an event at, at this magnitude. Uh, and also the, the local population, many, of, uh, many people, they just, because uh, since uh, many of these uh, cities were in democratic countries, so the, the local population had a say and they said, we don't want you to, uh, uh, to organize the games. And uh, with this regard, uh, I think that the, uh, the IOC will have to change uh, something in the future if it doesn't want to scare away uh, like cities, uh, winter sports and also summer sport uh, destinations uh, in in dem Western democratic, uh, democratic countries. Um, I am afraid, but we are already over time. Uh, we could uh, further discuss this among us, but I would also like to include the audience uh, and to raise questions or comments. So I have a look whether, so those in the chat, I, there is no message now in the chat, maybe here in the audience, somebody wants to, raise a question or a comment, please don't be afraid. We're just us. <laughs> yes, please. But uh, could you please come to the front and raise your question? Uh, yeah, so uh, Aistan, you sort of brought up, uh, you know, this sort of talk around like um, sort of comparing the current situation to sort of the Cold War. But I, I would say that it's, a, it's quite different because the Soviet Union was a very different beast than, than the modern Chinese because they couldn't really apply soft power. You know, the, the only thing the Soviet Union could do to sort of uh, affect other nations was sort of threaten them with hard power, with military action. So um, I, I think like Olympics, the Olympics is kind of a, an example of that, like sort of soft power trying to affect nations by other means. Um, if you had any comments on that? I don't know if it was, was a very clear question, but it wasn't very specific. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, it, it's good that you raised the questions is if anyone is uh, sort of um, um, misunderstood my statement. I, I think this happens a lot. If you just mention the word Cold War, people think you are comparing uh, the new superpower rivalry to the Cold War. Uh, but of course, everything is different. Um, the economic interaction is completely different. Uh, the ideological rivalry is different. Uh, China is not you know, seeking worldwide revolution, communist revolution. 
uh, not supporting communist parties in Europe or in, in other places around the world. Um, the uh, military uh, rivalry is very different. Um, the United States and the Soviet Union faced each other on the ground in Europe. You had an east-west divide, you had a Berlin Wall, you had a Iron Curtain. Today, the United States are facing China in the maritime domain of East Asia, in the South China Sea, in the Taiwan Strait, in East China Sea. This is very different. Uh, it has a different arms raising. It has different alliance relationships. It has a different risk of war. Um, it is a higher risk of war today between the United States and China because of the geopolitical ri rivalry at sea compared to the rivalry in Europe. So, so everything is different from the Cold War. But at the same time, there are some similarities um, because you have, again, two superpowers and they are confronting each other. And, and then you see more, when it comes to the economic relationship, you see more uh, 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 decoupling is, is the American word, but they're seeking to become more independent instead of interdependent. When it comes to the military spare, you see uh, not the same arms racing as you saw during the Cold War, but there is a military buildup on both sides, definitely. So, so you have this similar dynamic. When it comes to soft power, I, I don't see China you know, really enhancing their soft power through these Olympic Games, no more than what the Soviet Union enhanced their soft power during the Moscow Olympic Games in 1980. Um, so, so I, I don't, I don't completely buy into that. This is, is this particular Olympic is 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 boosting China's soft power more than the uh, Moscow Olympic boosted uh, the Soviet Union's soft power. Um, and and in 1980, that also came on a you know at a time when many were fearing the Soviet Union. Uh, it, it looked very powerful. It just intervened in Afghanistan. There was this. Uh, boycott, of course, from the from the United States and some of its allies. So it's it it, it wasn't that different. Um, so so I, I think uh, of course China has more uh, opportunities for enhancing their soft power. Clearly, because the world is globalized, China is is has a very different ideological uh, uh, ambitions. They have a, a different view of the international order about multilateral cooperation and so forth than the Soviet Union had. So yes, they have greater opportunities for soft power, but this particular Olympic doesn't really seem to me that, that that's what they are gaining from that. Um, we can probably disagree, uh, disagree on this. I, I just want to throw out a question maybe to the other panelists. I mean, uh, would China have different opportunity for soft power if it wasn't for the COVID pandemic. If we would sort of imagine that this Olympic would be, you know, uh, not this lockdowns, not this kind of type of control, but that m much more of the whole world could come to China, experience China. W would this be different? What, what do the other panelists think about that? I would I like to say- uh, Sorry, Shashri, go. <laughs> Sorry, I missed out. I missed that part of the discussion because I was in a different meeting. But um, yeah, I would just like to say that it's especially when it comes to the coverage from inside the bubble, uh, because you know there's been all this situation where where you have all these um, sports stars who are being isolated in their hotels, not getting enough food. You know, it's like a very like negative um, situation, which kind of affects a lot of people who look at China and because they have such a strict COVID regime, we just kind of, we don't see anywhere else. This makes a very, um, was like negative exotic approach to China. I think it creates, and, um, I think it would be really, really different if people were allowed to come to China, go to the great wall, see people dancing in the streets, like people were out, you know, doing their just daily life, which is really, you know, really an um, experience for most people who come to China, eat their food, you know, have, uh, you know, happy moments with the, with the locals. I totally think they, in that case, the Olympics would, you know, this political boycott of, uh, of uh, the Olympics would soon be forgotten and we'll just look at the games and how people are enjoying China. So yes, I think it would 
be a huge difference if that happened. And I think social media itself has ask. become kind of a, a has become a power tool for China. They're speaking a lot about soft power in Chinese. Uh, so this uh, concept from Joseph Nye, it, it came right at a time when China was rising, beginning of the 2000s, and they embraced it wholeheartedly. And when it suits China, they they pull up soft power. But when it comes down to it, it seems very much to be about the hard power. So, for example, um, there has been a lot of writing both within China, but even more in uh, Western countries about how student scholarships have been a tool for soft power. But um, now that the COVID epidemic has uh, first made people leave and then um, uh, banned students from foreign students from coming back, there haven't been great initiatives to bring them back on Chinese soil. Although there's been huge mobilizing abroad from these students who are, who, at this point have been waiting more than two years and had their lives put on hold with an uncertain future uh, to open China's borders. They could have made a corridor in the same way as they made a corridor into the Olympic village and they chose not to do it. And I think this is just one example of how these um, soft power tools that we present as being very uh, powerful <laughs> are not uh, the priority of the Chinese government. Thank you, that's a very good point. Um, we have a, a question from the audience. Uh, it, it doesn't say to whom it is directed, oh, we have another one. Um, have we seen Western democracies acting more like China with the unprecedented lockdowns and restrictions? I don't know who wants to answer this question. I can say something about it. Uh, New Zealand is one country that also had this no, uh, uh, zero COVID approach. But, uh, and there's been a couple of others, I think, but they all gave up on it because they, they realized it was too expensive, too difficult. And also now with Omicron, they think it's not as dangerous. So China is now left as the only one who's really struggling to keep their fence up. Taiwan also, but Taiwan is not the Western democracy. It's a democracy, but it's Taiwan also has a zero COVID um, and fares quite well with that. We see how long that takes. Um, anybody else on that question? Otherwise, I we have uh, there is another question. Do you have any solutions or way to help Chinese people who have different pol uh, political opinions against the Chinese Communist Party, uh, people who live in China? Because we feel like like oh sorry, um, because we feel like life in a big jail sometimes. I don't yeah like life would be living in a big jail sometimes. Any solutions to help the Chinese people? I think it's not in, it's not our role to, to help the Chinese people. And we would only do the Chinese people who are struggling a disservice at this point, probably if we made ourselves into some kind of European saviors of the Chinese people. And we see that very much when um, Chinese dissidents have gone abroad, that uh, they have been portrayed as traitors, as being allied not with their own people, but with someone else as, as being opportunistic. So, um, of course, there are things that we can do to stand in solidarity, but uh, to pro any solutions would have to come from within China. Yeah, specific, specifically now it's, um, you know, in situations like in Hong Kong, for example, it's quite dangerous now to have any um, strong connection to foreign forces that's used against people who, you know, are connected to any NGO with foreign influence, for example. So this, uh, I think for this time, um, it's very difficult to do anything else than just um, what Heidi says here to see what happens within the regime. Um, maybe 
at some stage it will change in China, but then the forces will come from within. I think as long as the country is moving in a direction that gives a lot of people opportunities and better welfare and better education possibilities, it's kind of not possible, I think, for uh, like a huge up, uprisal in, in China or any big change for now. And maybe when things have changed for the better for the whole nation and, um, you know, uh, maybe if the Communist Party are not, is not able to deliver, we might see more um, stronger forces than we do now about change. But for now, I think uh, that's not happening. Einstein, do you want to comment on that? No, uh, well, I, I think I think this is very difficult. Uh, I, I think uh, Heidi is absolutely right. It is it's really hard for for uh, for any country outside uh, or any uh, other citizens and Chinese to to change the political system in in, in China. The, 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 the broader question is is what we are doing uh, in a sense of. Uh, you know, is it helpful to have political boycotts of the Olympics? Is it helpful to have a uh, a stronger kind of policy against China when it comes to trade, when it comes to technology, when it comes to science cooperation and so forth? Um, I think that is a huge issue, which is there's no time for this now. But I mean, clearly, even a small country like Norway has... Um, helped China develop into the particular state that it's become, although it's played a very minor role. But on key areas, uh, let's say uh, the buildup of the, the Chinese Navy, the Norwegian you know, uh, shipping industry has been influential for the last two decades in, in keeping um, different... Uh, um, uh, uh, yards in China uh, full, keeping their bookings there. Uh, so, so, I mean, everything we do together with China also help uh, the Chinese Communist Party to become more powerful. Uh, and should we reconsider some of this? Should Norway have a trade agreement with China? I mean, these issues are to be debated. Uh, whether they will help uh, the, the Chinese people as this particular uh, uh, participants in this webinar ask, is, is, is really hard to say. Probably not. Uh, but uh, should we just continue to strengthen the Communist Party of China? Yes, that's indeed a very big question. Um, uh, how to approach, uh, how to deal with China, I think it's one of the, it's the challenging question of our times. How to deal with it. Uh, what, what can what can we uh, what effect do our do our actions our decisions have on 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 the situation in China especially the Chinese people? Uh, unfortunately, one hour has passed. We are already over time, and I would like to thank all the participants, um, the uh, the the experts of the of the of the roundtable but also the audience for coming and uh and for joining us today um we invite you to uh follow events of uh bergen global uh on the website and to join them um online and offline um in in big numbers so thank you again and have a nice day um to you all.